Yes, I don't know if our speakers actually need an introduction, but uh, they'll get one anyway. So uh, Nikos is, uh, I think everybody knows him from uh, being the star of the Daily Objective, but he is also an author of two books. He is the director of the Ayn Rand Institute Europe. He's a fellow, visiting fellow. And, uh, and I'm still yeah. visiting? <laughs> Uh, Yaron Brook is the chairman of the board of the Ayn Rand Institute, and um, Don Watkins has, I think, several titles which change from time to time. Uh, to eat. The head of the coaching program. Wow. Uh, head of <laughs> Director of coaching and mentoring. Yes. That is and, the final enduring until next year. And uh, Don and Yaron are also co-authors of Three books, um, Free Market Revolution, Equal is Unfair, and The Moral Case for Finance. And just because Wazi ignored it, I am the host of the Year One Book Show. Yes. <laughs> just that a little side gig I have. We were saving that for when we go live so people uh, on YouTube know that. Yeah, I'm not uh, introduce am I introducing the speakers again? No. No. People on our channel should, should know. But uh, yeah, so please join me in welcoming our speakers. And uh, Daniel, you can go live. Okay, good. So, first of all, thanks so much for honoring us with your yes. presence. As Don says, whenever someone consumes your contents, all other things equal, they consider it more interesting than everything in the world, from Netflix to sex. So, we really appreciate you being here. So, what was the idea behind today's, uh, today's topic? There are philosophies out there, like Stoicism or Effective Altruism, that in some ways promise the same thing as objective promise, which is a good life. That follow this philosophy, and your life will be in some way better. Stoicism says you will be prepared for the suffering which is life. So, with Stoicism, you in, you make sure that you suffer voluntarily, so then you are ready for the real deal. And with effective altruism, it is that you make sure how every day of your life and all aspects of your life, including your career, is targeted towards the good, which for that ideology, the good is helping others. Now, here's what I find very mysterious, and I hope you help me solve it. Stoicism, with various expressions, books, podcasts, has millions of followers. I checked before we enter the room, the daily stoic, has close to 750,000 subscribers on YouTube. How many subscribers have we got, Razi? A bit less. 4, okay. And the question is why? Why is it that this philosophy becomes more inspiring or more appealing to people? And when it comes to effective altruism, it's, as I found on the internet, a billion dollar business, which means entrepreneurs, Productive people, so people who should be also our audience, target, whatever you want to call it, are considering it a very appealing philosophy. So today we're trying to answer two questions. First, what is that objectivism, that effective egoism is offering people in terms of the good life? And second, and personally the most interesting thing for me, why is it that we're not winning? I think we have the better ideas. Why is it that Stoicism, which tells you that suffering is cool, why is it more appealing than the philosophy which says you life is good living? So, we start with Don, and then we go to Yaron, and make sure you actively participate in the Q&A, because I consider this very important, that when we leave this room, we have a better understanding of what is happening, and we start fixing this. I don't want in three years to still wonder, oh, why is objectivism less popular than Stoicism? It should be, do you remember three years ago when the counter attack started? So, Don. So, uh, wait, are we answering both questions at once, or are we answering them one at a time? You say and answer whatever you want. I'm just setting what the agenda, so. Yeah, so we'll get to the why. You will get, yeah. I, certain ideas are winning, but I think I want to start out by just giving a little bit of the lay of the land, or how I think about the lay of the land, and that is, if we're thinking about the good life and what we want from life, the culture offers kind of two basic alternatives. 
One is happiness without morality, and the second is morality without happiness. So happiness without morality, this is, so morality is basically fundamental guidance on what it means to be a good person on how to live and how to act. And the, the conventional approach to anybody offering happiness has nothing to do with morality. It's, there's really kind of two places that people will turn if they're seeking guidance on happiness. So one will be more broadly, you could think of it as self-help genre, right? And here there's, it's an eclectic, uh, kind of set of ideas, tactics. Many of them are contradictory. A lot of them are superficial. So just to give an example, you'll have a lot of the, um, gurus like Tony Robbins will talk about, you got to set goals and pursue your goals. But what advice do they offer about what kind of goals to set? What kind of goals are worth striving for? And what are the fundamental virtues that will allow me to achieve goals? And what kind of goals can fit together coherently? There's no guidance on that at all. And so what it basically amounts to is do what you want and be really excited about it. Like that's the kind of guidance you get, I think, from the self-help world. And I don't want to devalue it completely because it can give you very cool tactical things uh, as Nikos may talk about, it can be inspiring and motivational, but it definitely does not give you a coherent framework for what happiness is and how to achieve it. The other place that we get happiness without morality is psychology. And here you have psychologists who will often engage in studies that will try to assess what really makes people happy. Being born in Sweden. Being born in Sweden. <laughs> well, it's... It, uh, so what they'll use is happiness studies. And happiness studies, they, they're, they, they're conducted in different ways, but one way is they just ask people, how happy are you? Rank it. And just to give one brief, you mentioned Sweden, one brief illustration of how it like really, uh, let's call it unrevealing these studies are. So in Sweden, it's something like, I'm going to get the exact numbers wrong, but the relationships are right. Um, about 10% of people will say, yeah, I'm, I'm absolutely happy. Or no, it's, um, what, it, what it basically amounts to, I wish I could remember the exact numbers, what it basically amounts to is that um, pe the, the number of people who say they're happy, it uh, doesn't like integrate the number of pe people who say they're clinically depressed. So it'll be like, you know, 90% of people say that they're happy and 20% of people will say they're clinically depressed. And so you get, there's, there's some kind of clash going on here. And again, it's not that these psychological studies tell us nothing, but how you define happiness is a philosophic question. And so people can say they're happy when by any standard, their life isn't going the way they want it to, they're suffering. You know, different cultures generally, well, I mean, there's some cultures uh, that it's just culturally you never admit to being happy. I think you've said the Israelis uh, you're on, like it's never okay to... Yeah, Jews never say they're happy. Yeah. Happy? <laughs> How can you be happy? Whereas other cultures, you can be completely miserable, but it's expected that you say that you're happy. <laughs> so I just think it's not sufficient guidance that you get when you have happiness without morality. And then morality without happiness, I think we'll explore this in more detail. Nikos mentioned the effect of altruism. This is basically, and the Stoics, this is basically the idea that morality, being good, what the good life consists of, is something other than your personal happiness. So the effective altruists, for instance, they take for granted you should do the most good. Well, what is the most good? It's placing others above yourself. And so here's some of the concrete guidance that you should give. What do you want to do with your life? What kind of work would fill you with passion? Screw that. No, no, no. You need to pick a job that's going to be really high paying so that you can donate most of the money to charity. You're going to be miserable? Too bad. You can, you can save lives that way. How many kidneys do you have? Anybody here have more than one? <laughs> Get rid of the other one. Give it to some stranger because that's what it means to be a good person. It's the elevation of others above your own personal happiness. And, it's the, and, and stoicism is uh, a similar sort of thing. It's the idea that no, it's not striving to be happy. It's striving not to experience negative emotions by not caring about anything in particular. And so, like, a, a kind of ideal would be, you know, if you can feel indifferent to winning the lottery, 
versus having your best friend killed right in front of you, great job. You've managed to attain like the right orientation to life. And I mean, to me, that's not a description of happiness. It's not a description of the good life. It's a description of a lobotomy. Um, and so what Ayn Rand offers and what I think is so inspiring and valuable about it is a morality of happiness. It's going to give you fundamental guidance on what it means to be a good person, but being a good person means good for you, for your happiness and for your joy. So I'll just leave it at that. There's a lot more to say about that, but Yaron, maybe you can fill in uh, if you want to elaborate on anything else, but definitely on the positive of what it means to be egoistic. Yeah, I mean, first let's be clear that, because um, I saw some stuff on, online about this, uh, the title of this, which I assume is yours, yeah, my, my next book will have the, the name, Effective, effective egoism. egoism. Okay, uh, so Effective Egoism, um, which I assume does Don's because it's a clever title, and Don always comes up with the clever titles. Uh, in a sense, again, it's like anything egoism, like rational egoism, and it, it's, it's a redundancy. The, 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 the whole point of egoism is to be effective at living. It's to be effective at living your life for the purpose of your happiness, your success, your achievement, your flourishing, uh, at living. And what, of course, because we're talking about a, a philosophy, it A, tells you why you should live your life for you, it gives you a reason for it, and then what Rand does is she provides a, a, a approach, a whole system of looking at the world and how to choose your values, what should guide your choice of the values to pursue. Uh, it's not what you feel like. It's not, uh, you know, uh, uh, avoiding pain. It's not doing what the culture expects. That is altruism. It's not other. It's what really is good for me. Uh, and of course, the methodology of doing that is 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 to use reason to to look at the world to evaluate what is actually good for human beings, what is not good for human beings, what should be embraced, the good, and what should be avoided, the bad, for human life. So first, what are the principles? What are the what are the principles that are universal, that are true of all human beings? Right? Follow reason. That's true of all human beings. And only once you get the principles, uh, you know, uh, reason, productiveness, uh, honesty, and so on, then can you start talking about okay, now what values are going to lead to my happiness? How do I take that and break it down to the more concrete values that are actually personal? Now, we're going to choose different careers, we're going to choose different people to marry, we're going to choose different, uh, different types of restaurants to go to. We're, there are a lot of optional values now, but the focus, the orientation, is towards our own happiness, and it's always guided by the universal principles. So we have to achieve them through the use of reason, through, the, you know, through an understanding of of who we are and the nature of the world around us. So it's an incredibly, this is an incredibly powerful tool we now have, right, which is morality, the principles of morality, that now can shape each of our lives. Now we can take and turn it into, and this is why, you know, whenever somebody says, oh, you guys are a cult, or libertarians, for example, often a critique we hear from libertarians uh, is, objectivism is authoritarian. It's not really a philosophy of, uh, of liberty. Why? Because you have principles of morality, which means everybody has to be the same. And you have to, you have to, you know, if somebody's not rational, they're out, according to objectives. Right? And that leads to political authoritarianism. Now we're going to have a government saying what's rational, what's not. And I got this question in, in, in a in living room in Buenos Aires. I mean, that was serious. He just read The Virtue of Selfishness, and he took it as this is some kind of authoritarian morality. And, you know, the confusion, which is typical libertarian of morality with politics, right? They can't think of morality separate from politics. So, so if we have principles, that therefore, they're dictates, therefore, they're political. That is, there's punishment, not from reality, from other people. Um, so we have... Let me just, as an yeah. aside, like, but that's like saying, like, the principles of, like, of yeah. gravity is authoritarian, because the plane, if it doesn't obey... Mm -hmm. The you know laws of aerodynamics is going to crash to the ground. Yeah, that's true, but it doesn't mean that that dictates where the plane flies or the exact design of the plane. There's plenty of personal decisions that are left over. 
but it's accepting the framework of what does a human being actually require in order to thrive. And that's what they're throwing away and saying is authoritarian, that there are real requirements. And, and this is true of the culture generally. So the culture generally, for example, accepts broadly that there is a science of nutrition. Like there's certain things that you eat. Now we're not very good at the science of nutrition maybe, but there is a science. And there's certain things that we know are poison. And there's certain things that we think or know with some level of certainty that are good for you. And, and the methodology, there's a certain methodology that differentiate, and there's a certain methodology to ultimately arrive at what an ideal diet is. Uh, it, and there's a science thing, it, it, and a scientific method. But as soon as it comes to human behavior, and if you will, the spiritual world, the, the world of ideas, the world of values and virtues, and human action, there's no science. And this is, again, typically libertarian. There's no science. People should do whatever the hell they want, right? It doesn't matter. Yeah, who are you to tell me what's going to achieve happiness and what's not going to achieve happiness? I'm not anybody. It's reality that's going to dictate what will achieve happiness and what will not. So it's interesting how they, they, there's a certain line drawn on what they consider science and what is not science. We consider the spiritual values a question of science, a question of objective reality, studying reality, discovering truths about what actually leads to human survival thriving and happiness and that is both a empirical question and a question that is derived logically from our nature from what we are as human beings our rational faculty uh, and and that's the beauty is that we now have this these principles and now every value and every thing that you want that you think might lead to happiness you can test against these principles you can figure out is it rational? Does it disrupt my, you know, my career, which I know is, is 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 an important value to me because that's my purpose? Is it disruptive to that? You now have a framework from which to choose your values, and now you also know that the reason you're choosing these values is not because Nikos told you. It's not because uh, you know this is going to lead to somebody else's well-being and the society values that. But it's because it's your life. So you're immediately motivated to pursue them because it's you. It's about your life, your happiness, everything to do with you. So you take this self-help stuff, which a lot of people seem to be motivated by. So there's something in all of human beings out there that wants to pursue their own happiness. They're not allowed to do it because altruism nudges them backwards. But they're constantly seeking the superficial stuff so they can taste a little bit of the happiness, a little bit of the success. What objectivism liberates us to say, no, the self-help stuff, the good one, the, the good stuff, that's what it's all about. That's morality. That's what you should be pursuing. And here's, here's the principles by which to evaluate how to do it and by which to guide your direction and to motivate you and to drive you. And in that sense, we should, uh, you know, objectivists, when you integrate the philosophy, it makes you a passionate, the opposite of stoicism, right? You're engaged with your life. You're involved in your life. Everything is about this because everything is integrated. Everything is integrated around these principles that are leading you to happiness and are leading you to be a successful human being at this thing called life. Uh, so it's 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 everything that 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 affects altruism and stoicism isn't. It's fully, completely integrated because I mean, even the effect of altruists. Um, yeah, give up what your passion is and go and do a go pursue. Because they're scientific, right? They're not the kind of altruists of the past. Why are they effective altruists? Because the altruists of the past say, go become Mother Teresa. And these altruists, these new altruists are saying, wait a minute. Actually, becoming Mother Teresa might not be the best use of my time. If I care about other people, maybe the best use of my time is I go and start a company, make gazillions of dollars, and then, and then I can really have a huge impact. Say, so recognize that wealthy people have more of an impact than Mother Teresa had. So they're being scientific about it. They're thinking it through. Right? Well, I call them naive altruists. So they're really yeah. trying to take seriously yeah. that we're trying to lead to a good result for other people. They don't have a clear conception of what good would mean for another person, but they're really trying to think, what's the benefit that my sacrifices are bestowing on other people? But I think it's actually the Mother Teresa type who are really taking altruism seriously. Because altruism... Um, 
is really about the sacrifice. It's yeah. not about the benefit to other people. And so if you want a pure example of altruism, it's the kind of thing you run into every day. You very rarely run into somebody who's like, yeah, I gave a kidney away or I took a job on Wall Street that I hate just so I can give 90% to charity. But how many of us have met or uh, experienced the equivalent of the father who's having health problems and says to his daughter, you need to take care of me, you owe me. You, you need to put family first. It's people who try to instill guilt in order to demand your sacrifices. That is the face of altruism. It's not the person who's thinking about how can I do the most charitable thing. And that's where we really see it every day. And so in the sense of, I don't put Peter Singer in the leaders of effective altruism, I put them in that very negative category. But a lot of the attraction of effective altruism is people say, yeah, I really do want to do good. And, that, and, and, and I realize that just living among the poor doesn't do good. How can I do good? Um, but I think they're being naive about the nature of the moral code that they're trying to serve. Yeah, very much so. I mean, altruism is at the end of the day all about, uh, all about sacrifice. And even they, as scientific as they try to be, uh, you know, vaguely recognize that maybe business does good as well, because many of them are in business, particularly in Silicon Valley. Uh, but they can't really hold that. They can't hold that the profit motive, right, is actually helping other people, is making lives of other people Yeah, notice good. they never say, go start a business that makes a billion dollars, employs a whole bunch of yes. people, like that's off the table. Well, they want to do that, but so that they can do good afterwards, right? So that they can do the good, so they can give the money away, but not viewing the actual creating the business as a good, even with, even though in their context, right, doing good for other people, it is. It's much better than the charity you do, right? So, uh, so yes, they're completely evading, um, and in that sense, they strike me as the most benevolent of all the altruists because they, 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 they seem to have this real idea of, of doing good, of, of, of helping other people. They seem to really care about it. And they don't seem to really be suffering as much, right? So most of them actually, the ones I've met, actually pursuing careers and, and doing fun things and, and doing, and then, but they know they've got this tug of altruism on there. So they've got, so Peter Singh has this rule. Peter Singh is the philosopher, the Australian philosopher who is, uh, you know, who inspires many of these. He has this rule, take 10% of your income, like a tithing, and give it to charity, you know, give it to good charities, effective charities, right? And, and they, they're happy to do that. They, 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 you know, they do that, but then they, can, then they can go on with their life pretending that they were virtuous, and then they get into this happiness without morality. They tr they're still trying to look for happiness, but without any morality, uh, because the morality is the 10% they gave away, right? That, that covers their guilt. It doesn't really, of course. Well, no, I mean, that's, that's the thing. And if you read Singer's books, oh, yeah. uh, part of what he's holding up, so he tries to, in a, one way, assuage your guilt, being like, hey, if you do 10%, that's, that's good enough. But on the other hand, he talks about in lauds, um, he talks about this one girl who's struggling going, I really want to become a parent, but how can I justify that when I won't be able to give as much to charity, I won't be able to sacrifice enough. Um, and the most that Singer can say is, well, look, maybe your kid will go up to be an altruist. Yeah. That's the justification <laughs> for parenthood. And like, like, that is the level at which these people who take this seriously they wrestle with guilt every day. It's, yeah, I give 10%, so I'm not a monster. But Singer's own reasoning basically says you should be giving away as much as you can to Africa to the point where you would live like somebody in a poor African country. And he says, yeah, I don't do that, yeah, exactly. but I try my best. Yeah, exactly. he, 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 he is not one of those people, because, uh, but, he, but he's riddled with guilt. If you ever see interviews, he ever see talks of Peter Singer, you can tell he's riddled with guilt over the fact that he doesn't do more, that he's not willing to sacrifice He's not willing to suffer uh, like his philosophy, in a sense, necessitates. Um, so again, they, they come up with formulas and gimmicks to reduce the guilt without having to actually live a, a, a real altruistic life, which of course is impossible. And, and I think they know deep down that it's impossible. Now, Nikos asked the question, why are they successful? Uh, and by implication, why are we not? Uh, and that's that's a question we should always be asking, so I don't think we'll have the definitive answer today uh, because we should always be getting better at what we do. Uh, but why are they successful? They're successful because they haven't challenged the status quo. They're successful because they're taking what is in the culture, what is uh, deeply rooted in our religion and in our secular philosophy, and has been for 2,000 years, 
and they're just spitting off of it. They're just accepting it and then giving a little twist and making it sexy, making it a little bit more appealing. Uh, you know, the 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 the, the, the Stoics uh, pretend to care about you as an individual, um, but they've accepted the Christian view of life sucks and life is misery and life is suffering and they're giving you a cure for that detach from your emotions from it you know handle your suffering better be become become stronger to handle those emotions so it's a pretend self-help it's kind of, it's, it's kind of a, a self-help by by uh, by ignoring what you are but accepting fundamentally accepting the christian vision of life as suffering and life as a disaster. And of course, the, the, uh, the effect of altruists, again, they're altruists. Everybody's an altruist. What's new about that? Well, the only new thing is about it is they, they, they give it a guise of science. They give it a guise of sophistication. They give it a guise of success. You're going to be effective this time. This time we're really going to help other people. Um, and, and, and to a large extent, as Don said, they do it by ignoring what altruism is really about, which is your own suffering, your own sacrifice. Um, so they're effective or they're successful because they're mainstream, because they, they're never challenging the mainstream. They're not, they're not questioning the mainstream. They're just embracing it in, in the mainstream intellectually, the mainstream philosophically, and the mainstream in the street out there. If you stop somebody out there, ask them what morality is, they'd answer something vague that is similar to Effective altruism with the that, that That's what they, they actually produce. Yeah, I mean, I would say, first of all, I don't think effective altruism is popular. I think it's trendy. Like, I think it's a cool thing for people who are, like, in the know intellectually to be involved in. Stoicism, I think there's a, uh, it's popular in, uh, in comparison to other ideas. I think with Stoicism, it's, um, I agree with what Yaron said, but I think part of it is, one thing you see, so there's an objectivist view that ideas drive history, but the state of a culture can also drive ideas. And so what you've seen historically is that something like stoicism often becomes attractive when life feels very unstable and people don't know how to cope with it. And I think one of the attractions to stoicism is that life has been very scary and unstable really since 9-11. Uh, in the West, but particularly in the uh, last 10 or so years. And that creates a certain kind of attraction to it. But let me also name, I think, a better attraction to it. If you're pursuing your happiness and you're pursuing ambitious goals, one of the things you have to endure is challenging costs. And some of what people have taken from Stoicism is sort of like, what are the mind frames and tactics you can use to endure hardship on the way to an inspiring goal. And so one of the things, part of how stoicism became trendy is athletes got really turned on to it through Ryan Holiday's work. And I don't think they were sitting there going, I'm not gonna pursue values, I'm detached from reality. What they liked was the idea of, I need to push myself for six hours a day to train. That's really hard. How do I make myself accept that pain in order to get to my exciting goal, playing in the NFL or winning a championship? And that kind of advice um, was appealing to them. So I think there's an appeal to better people there. And even with effective altruism, as Jaron was saying, there's an appeal to better people, which is, I want to do something amazing in the world. I don't just want to like sit around and be poor with somebody. I want to solve cool problems. So I think both of them also try to appeal to better parts of human beings. Uh, we can talk about objectivism and the extent to which we've been successful or unsuccessful. But that's sort of how I think about how those ideas have achieved if not exactly popularity, then um, kind of uh, being sexy. I want to push the speakers a bit more on this. So if you want to be inspired on how to hustle, if you want to be inspired on how to give everything for your purpose, why Ryan Holiday, not Howard Rock? So I get what you say that uh, effective altruism is more in tune with dominant ideas. But particularly with Stoicism, it asks you to do difficult things. If you think about David Goggins, it's not easy to be David Goggins. And the mere fact that you see him, it puts the bar high. You see him say, oh, I could be better, I could do better. And the same happens with the heroes of Iron Run, particularly with, with Rourke. So let me ask once more, 
Why Stoicism and not the past? Well, I'll name one part of it. I don't. This may or may not be a fundamental, but I think it's real. Ryan Holiday's alive. Ayn Rand's not. If Ayn Rand was writing this today, I, I, I think. Let me put it more broadly. People respond to living figures who are helping them understand the world today. And the challenge we have is to be a compelling cultural figure in our, in our own right, who also is sharing Ayn Rand's framework. But part of the challenge is when you're presenting yourself as, hey, I'm an expert in Ayn Rand's framework, it's like, okay, but you know, that's from the past. I want to know what's cool today. Yeah, Brian Marcus, Holiday is cool Marcus today. Marcus Aurelius is also from the past. I know, but people don't respond to Marcus Aurelius. They respond to Tim Ferriss, Ryan Holiday, and then they go, oh, I guess I'll read your influences. But she was alive. Right? Yeah, so, but, but she during her time, she was a major cultural figure. Yeah, but not enough not, not enough to, to, to have the kind of impact these people had. Oh, no, she was as big as Ryan Holiday is today. I mean, not, not of any individual, but in terms of a, a, a movement. Stoicism today yeah. no, that is agree. bigger yeah. than objectivism was when she was alive. Uh, because it's debatable. The influence. I mean, the internet. I mean, it depends on the internet. The, internet. the internet. Atlas as a cultural force that people took seriously and were inspired by, I think, was as big. Yes. Certainly, yes. objectivism as a philosophy shaping people's thinking. There, you're definitely yes. right. Yeah. yeah, for sure. Yeah. And I think that's part of it. Objectivism is a philosophy. It's a philosophy shaping. Now, stoicism is kind of a philosophy, but it's relatively shallow. It doesn't demand that much. I mean, demands certain actions, but it doesn't demand intellectually that much. Uh, objectivism is... I mean, I know some people hate it when I say this, but qua philosophy, it's hard. It, 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 it is demanding because, and it's it, maybe it's the odd and demanding because it's so new and because it overturns so much of what philosophy is today. I mean, everything she says is in, in many respects the opposite of what philosophers have been saying for 2,000 years. People ask, well, there must have been another egoistic philosopher. I mean, Aristotle, 2,500 years ago. That's it. And then I went. And, you know, maybe Spinoza did a little bit. Maybe, but no, there hasn't been an egoistic philosopher for 2,500 years. And suddenly Ayn Rand comes on board and says, egoism. Well, it's going to take a while. 2,500 years of, you know, just going after uh, egoism and, and, and proposing the alternative. It's a very different it's very difficult to shift people's attitudes around these things, particularly in a Christian culture. And we're still a Christian culture, even though we've been in Christianity. We're still very much Christian in, in that sense. So I think it's the fact, you know, if Ayn Rand was a, um, I mean, I think of Stoicism as kind of a self-help, maybe a slightly different, uh, deeper self-help guy. If we, if we were just about like a superficial kind of morality thing, do your best, live life to the fullest, yeah, we would probably be bigger. But we actually have a whole theory about you have to use reason, and we have a theory about what reason is, and it's not just anything you want it to be, and it's, it's a, it, it functions by a particular methodology, and it's important for at least some of us to understand that methodology so we can exhibit it. it, it, it there's, a, there's so much there. It's not just, at the end of the day, it boils down to morality and living your life. But you have to know so much more in order to do that well. And it just is too much of a heavy lift, I think, for most people. Well, even the people who want, so I work with a lot of young people trying to implement this philosophy in their lives. And the striking thing, and this is true for me too, um, and in many ways still is, it's a work in progress. Even when you want to live by the philosophy because you think it's really getting reality right, even when you finally come to understand what it's actually kind of asking you, what, how would I actually live by this? you can still struggle with it. I mean, th there's plenty of objectivists who find you like, I still have kind of Christian attitudes towards sex that makes me feel uncomfortable or guilty, or I still struggle with certain things in the productive realm. It's really hard because it's so fundamental. So one way to think about what morality does to a person or is to a person is that it's shaping your self-esteem and how you evaluate your self-esteem. And so when you ask somebody to change a philosophy, particularly change your morality, what you're saying is your whole self-concept is now thrown into question and you have to rearrange how you evaluate yourself in the deepest sense. That is a big, big ask and no other philosophy today is asking something that fundamental of people.
cool. So let's go to the audience. There's also a couple of super chats. Let's start with the super chat because we're for a profit business, so we need to do that. And the first super chat is actually on the topic of uh, profit. So thanks to our friend who asked the question. And he asked, isn't profit, isn't profit motive inherently amoral or morally ambiguous at best? So maybe to translate it, you might want to make money and you do this by drugs, or you want to make money because you want to buy a Ferrari and you want to make your neighbor jealous. So why is profit motive inherently more or easy? <laughs> um, I think it absolutely is. Um, it's like saying, Absolutely is amoral or? <laughs> it absolutely is moral. Uh, absolutely is moral. It's like saying, uh, it's like saying sex is absolutely good. With everyone? <laughs> Under any circumstances? Can you imagine a circumstance where sex is not good for you? Yeah, lots. But does that mean sex in, in what we mean by sex? Not good. Yes, it's absolutely good. Right? So everything is, you have to hold context. You always have to hold context. Nothing is in that sense absolute and it applies everywhere, all the time, in absolutely every circumstance one can even imagine. The profit motive is absolutely a good because it represents the best in you. It represents your ability to produce and create value. To create value that is uh, then objectively validated by, if you will, the marketplace, by the fact that people are willing to pay for it more than it costs you to produce. So it's a value that the market validates. So it's it's absolutely good because you're producing pro-life, pro-human being values that the market is willing to compensate you for and, and, and validate for. What happens, what about drugs? Or what about something that you produce that's harmful to other people? Well. That's a real exception, but that's an exception to the whole issue of production. That is, yes, people can be unbelievably irrational and willing to engage in self-destructive activities. And, you know, you producing to satisfy the irrationality is not a good, whether, it's, whether it produces a profit or not. Profit is not relevant there to the actual fact that what you're doing is not good. You're, you're producing a product that inherently is self-destructive. It causes destruction to your clients. The fact that they want to destroy themselves, the fact that they're masochists in some weird way, is not something you should be proud of helping them to do. So um, profit, even if you lose, even if it's a losing venture, it's a bad venture. Profit is not the relevant parameter. The parameter there is the unvirtuousness of producing the thing that you're producing. That doesn't make productiveness, for example, not a virtue, right? Because some things to produce is not good. That makes sense? Let me have one of the mics of the audience and we we'll keep the... So, who had their hand first? There. Then one... So, the order will be one super chat, one audience. Hey, you should reward live audience of a super chat. I agree, but the boss disagrees. <laughs> Wait, wait a second, there's somebody who's more of a boss than me? My other boss. <laughs> <laughs> Who pays you more? <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, Rosie. <laughs> so, Don, first of all, uh, I appreciate it. I'm happy that you're writing Effective because um, I own the domain name, .com. If you want, I can transfer it to you. <laughs> uh, you're not going to give it away? <laughs> he said it transferred to you. Oh, okay. Right. He didn't say so. Yeah, that's right. My question is, uh, if you follow a rational epistemology, isn't evidence-based psychology more rational and evidence-based than the objective theory of happiness? Because they do clinical trials, they have a scientific method, and we do not. Um, that's a good question. So the issue comes down to, how are you even defining happiness? Because it makes a big difference. Like, what are you measuring? And there's no real answer to that. I mean, they have certain kinds of answers, but it, it's a complete um, haphazard mixture of things like 
uh, what we would consider happiness, a jolt of feeling good for some reason, um, lack of anxiety and depression, so you could call it like a zero. Um, it's a whole conglomeration of things, and even that they don't directly measure. It's not like they measure this thing that they don't quite define. It's that they have, what they do is they have a whole bunch of questions that um, if you look at most of the kind of um, the questionnaires used to assess happiness, what they really are is anti-anxiety or anti-depression measures. So it's not even attempting to measure happiness. It's just these things are correlated with lack of depression and anxiety, and we're going to call that happiness, and that's going to be our standard for happiness studies. You can't get around the fact that what happiness is is a philosophic question. And then you have to get that if you, once you get to that what happiness is, is that it's a condition that one achieves through the attainment of a non-contradictory code of values, you realize that there's a philosophic assessment involved in what kind of values are good, are achievable, and can fit together in a non-contradictory way. And then if you see, if you think about Ayn Rand's guidance on well, what are the kind of virtues that one would have to practice to bring those values into existence? You get that it's philosophic. It's not an issue of watch people walk around for 20 years and if they seem to be like in a pretty good mood at the end, that's good for them. It's a certain um, relationship between consciousness and existence. All of her virtues are the right relationship between your mind and reality, which is a whole philosophic perspective on reality. So in that sense, it's scientific in the sense of it's the science that is relevant to happiness at the most fundamental level is philosophy. It's how do I bring myself in the proper alignment with reality? That said, is it valuable as supplemental guidance to have studies on things like what are the kinds of activities that people do that reduce anxiety and depression and that build solid relationships? Absolutely. I, um, it was before when I was on the uh, before I was coming over here today. I was um, listening to an interview with John Gottman, who does psychological research on what healthy relation what makes for healthy relationships. That's hugely valuable, and you couldn't get that from philosophy. But you still need a fundamental guidance from philosophy for what is the role of a relationship in my life, and what is the fundamental thing I should be seeking from it. And so, what philosophy is giving you is fundamental guidance that can't be replaced by psychology, because psychology is counting on a lot of insight from philosophy in these realms. And the most fundamental thing it counts on, I think, is like, what even is happiness? But how falsifiable is it, the whole theory of objectivism? Well, it's falsifiable by coming up with a better argument. Come up with an argument why it's not true. I don't think falsifiable is the standard for what's rational. Um, that comes from a Popperian kind of perspective that I think is, is really wrong. The issue is not, is this falsifiable? The issue is, did you prove it? Did you validate it? Did you provide evidence? Existence exists is not falsifiable. But it's true. That's the I think the right perspective on knowledge. But there, there, is, there is an empirical dimension here, right? So if it turns out that a, a bunch of people follow Ayn Rand's philosophy uh, and follow these principles and somehow nobody's happy, right, then there would be a problem. You know, we'd have to we'd have to question. Maybe we've made some errors in our assumptions. Maybe we've made some errors in application. Maybe we we made some errors somewhere. So there has to be there has to be a, a, a realization, right? An empirical. And where do we get these principles for and and the understanding of the logic? We get it from reality. So I think that at the end of the day, if psychology understood what happiness was, had a proper definition of it. And you know, had the ability to measure aspects of it at least, elements of it, then they would be completely consistent, and there would be no difference between what our morality teaches us and what they're second, because there is no different. There is no difference between um, the theory and the practice. They should be integrated. They should be the same. I think what the fact that we're seeing a difference today, supposedly, is exactly what Don said. They don't know what happiness is. They don't know what they're measuring. They're measuring the absence of things, not the positive elements of it. They have no theory of it. You can't have empirical studies without theory. That's part of what comes out of the Popperian nonsense, is that you come up with some 
uh, you know, uh, uh, abstract theory that, that, that can be random. But here there's a logical theory. It has to be a logical theory connected to reality, which you then test, which you can test. And, and, but the tests have to be congruent with theoretical knowledge, which they don't have. So it doesn't surprise me that it doesn't line up today because they don't know what they do today. Since we're talking about science. It's, it's, it's very early in the, in, in the, I mean, all the science, all the humanities, all the social sciences and humanities are uh, misaligned in the way they measure the stuff that they measure and what they are looking at and, and the kind of studies, including economics. They, they, most of the empirics in economics are worthless, are worthless because they don't have a proper theoretical context in which they're looking at the empirical data. We have a relevant super chat. Many thanks to Daniel for your contribution. And he says, where does the idea that human beings are more motivated by avoiding pain than pursuing pleasure come from? So we, um, I mean, yeah, it just depends on how you want to answer it. Well, look, I think there's a certain plausibility to it. That is, I mean, if you just think biologically, right, the downside of death is pretty big compared to the upside of being a little bit happier. So that's not, so in a sense, you could say that there's a stronger pool of negatives or a stronger urgency of them, but that's not really the issue. The issue is what's your orientation in life? Is it towards the achievement of positives and then dealing with negatives when they come up and you have to deal with them? Or is it your whole focus is avoiding negatives? And what objectivism says is not that you'll, um, that positives are the only thing that matter in life, it's that your orientation is towards the positive. And that when negatives come up, then you focus on them, you deal with them, and you get back to the positive. So it's, I, I think there, there's a certain kind of plausibility. I see why people have that kind of view, but it's not, it's not getting to the issue. The issue is where's my focus in life? What do I regard as important, worthy of attention? What do I regard as essential? This is one of the core themes of Atlas Shrugged. It took me a long time to appreciate that this was central to it, which was um, what matters in life. And it's the positive, happiness, joy, success. Ayn Rand was not a fool. She grew up in Soviet Russia. She knew what suffering, fear, destruction, enslavement were. And she still was able to maintain the view that that's not what matters in life. And the Stoics are the people who, in the face of living in a Western country, look out and say, ah, man, there's some problems. I guess life is suffering. Sure, Peterson. But, <clears throat> but yeah, I mean, it's all over Christianity, right? Uh, the purpose of life uh, is, is, is not some positive to be pursued in this life. It's an afterlife. It's something afterwards. Right now, in this life, life sucks. Avoid pain. Avoid pain as much as you can so that you can, you, you can make it, right, to... To, to ultimately to to where where you know uh, uh, pleasure exists it doesn't exist here the good doesn't exist here it exists in, in in this afterlife and there's another aspect to it it's in human history how many people have had the time and if you will the energy to focus on the good like life sucked for people most of history so it's not just pain really is real. Uh, there's a, I mean, it, it's, it's kind of weird in the 21st century to assume that life sucks when life is like unbelievably good. But for most of human history, people got up in the morning, went to work, drudgery, the work was drudgery for the most part, came home, ate, and went to sleep. And that was life. And they died at 36. And it, so you can see why Hobbes would say, you know, uh, life is short, what is it? Short, nasty, brutish. nasty, brutish, and short. Because it was, for most people, for a big chunk of the population, it was nasty, brutish, and short. And there were a few people who had it a little better, right? Uh, but for most of history, people didn't have the time and the energy to focus on the positive and to devote time to the positive. And that was the exception. The rule was drudgery. Um, and it, the reason for that is the, 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 is the lack of reason and the lack of industry and the lack of what ultimately led to our prosperity, which allows us time to think about happiness and to think about the values, to pursue, what values to pursue. But that, in a sense, there are very few cultures in history, Greece, a little bit in Rome, and then the Renaissance on. And even the Renaissance on, 
what percentage of the population benefited from that until until the Industrial Revolution? 10%? Most of the people lived in drudgery. So it's an achievement to get to the point where uh, most of humanity can really focus on happiness. A friend of the back, then a friend of the front. Um, I have a question. Uh, don't you think that um, these ideas of morality of goods, they are really like for naive people? Um, what is the measure of morality? Is it a law? Is it a book that says this is how you should do? Or as long as you can get away with things, this means you know you haven't done anything wrong. Because I mean we can pretend there is like good and bad, but then ultimately, um, you know, it's who is stronger, this person wins. I mean, what is morality? Like I, I just I came to the conclusion that really like this sort of biblical. I want, like, I'm now asking myself, like, these biblical things of good, um, what are they for? Because, uh, yeah, like, as long as you can get away, there are plenty of examples of people win if you can get away with things. And I mean, it's just, uh, let's be a little bit cynical, not just say, oh, this is good, this is bad, you know? <laughs> Well, I mean, a starting point for thinking about it is clearly there's some things good and bad for your life, right? Like, it's not a matter of opinion. If you got cancer, would that be good for your life or bad for your life? It would be bad. So there's an objective standard that might be hard to articulate, but there's some clear things that impact you and allow you to live better, and the things that hold you back, tear you down, move you towards death. And then it's a question of how you discover those and how you figure out what those things are. And so the, there, I don't think there can really be any objection that there's some objective standard of what's good and bad for you. Like it's self-evident that people's lives can be going in better and worse directions, can be in better and worse conditions. And then the question is, can you articulate a standard that helps you assess, okay, well, what choices can I make that will actually put my life in the best state possible? Now, once you've answered that, and we can talk about Ayn Rand's answer to that, but I think the core of the answer comes from the fact that in order to figure out what is objectively good for an entity, what you have to think about is their basic means of survival. That's going to give you the deepest insight into what improves their life and what holds it back. And I think one of, most, one of Ayn Rand's most profound insights and it's central to her philosophy is that human beings, our basic means of survival is our mind, is reason. Reason is what allows us to identify our values, formulate a long-range vision for our life, build a life that is actually achievable, successful, and can achieve happiness. And so that is what allows us to assess the fundamental things that are good for us and the fundamental things that are bad for us. Now then if you ask, okay, if that's true, and I'm stipulating it, I haven't proven it, obviously, right? If that's true, what does it mean to say, if I get away with something? Like, what would that even mean? Well, I mean, I guess you could take like an example, right? Um, it's wrong to lie. Is it okay to lie then if I can get away with it? Which means not get caught by somebody. Well, first of all, you can't too quickly say, oh, I won't get caught, right? Every thief thinks he's not going to get caught. But if you if you steal something, it's a fact, and in principle, a fact can be discovered. So you don't know you're going to get away with it. But even there, what's the whole meaning of it? What am I trying to achieve? Because this is really, the I think, the core of the issue. Um, the reason not to lie or not to steal or not to murder or not to cheat on your spouse is not because I might get caught. It's because that's not what I want from life. I have a vision of what I want from life. I want to be a writer who's surrounded by friends who provide me with intellectual stimulation, who spends my days enjoying great heroic art that inspires me, who falls in love with somebody that I admire. That's what I want from life. Is a policy of lying, cheating, and stealing going to move me closer towards that or away from that? It's going to move it away from it. I'm not going to be a person worthy of admiration. I'm going to turn other people's rationality instead of the biggest reward, a huge threat to me. The stupider they are, the, be the less likely I'll get caught. The smarter they are, 
the more likely, the more I'm vulnerable. It's throwing away the life that I want to do something, even if I might not get caught. There's no value there. There's no reward. Money? What's that money going to buy me if I've lost everything on this earth that I care about? I mean, this is the problem of the fact that we associate morality with what you said, biblical, the Bible, right? We associate morality with religion. And yeah, why should you follow the Ten Commandments? Who cares? If I can get away with it, cool. There's no God anyway. So who's going to catch me? And who's going to punish me? There's no heaven or hell, so I'm going to do whatever the hell I want. As long as I can get away with it. And other people let me get away with it. I'll do it. But that's a false orientation around what morality means and what morality is. Morality is not about cheating on some other, not about a system imposed on you that somebody arbitrarily decided is right or wrong, which is what religion, religious morality is. Morality is about, and this is Ayn Rand's innovation, in a sense it's Aristotle's, but Ayn Rand really fleshes it out and really gives it, gives it foundation. Morality is a set of guidelines how to live a good life. And if it's a set of guidelines on how to live a good life, and it's a good set of guidelines on how to live a good life, why would you want to cheat on it? Why would you want to get away with anything? Because it's not that other people are judging you. Is she moral or isn't she moral? That's not morality. It's you judging yourself. Am I living a good life or aren't I living a good life? So if, 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 um, you know, if, if you teach me how to, uh, you know, how to, I'm trying to think of an analogy, how to be a good surgeon, and there's a way to be a bad surgeon, you kill all your patients, and there's a way to be a good surgeon, you get the exact result, why would I ever want to be a bad surgeon? I only want to do this well, because that's what I am. If I give you some principles on how to live a good life, what's the temptation of living a bad life? I want to give, yeah, you can get away with it, you can lie, you can cheat, you can steal. Sometimes you can get away with it. It's very rare that you can actually get away with it. But you're not going to live well. Now, if you tell me, no, 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 you aren't. You, you, I, can, I, I know people who like Stephen Shield and they live a great life. They're so happy. They're so successful. But I've never met anybody like that. It, it empirically doesn't exist. Go back to the empirical evidence, falsifiability. They just don't exist. They just don't exist. I, I, I mean, I like to say the only career in the world where lying is a virtue is politics. <laughs> but have you ever seen a happy politician? He's a pathetic, miserable, horrible human being. They really are. Because they lie. And lying has consequences on your own soul. This is kind of what Don was getting to. And it's not just uh, that you don't live the life you would want to live. Some of them don't know what life they want to live. They want power. Power is not a rational goal. And as a consequence, seeking power destroys you. It destroys your soul. It destroys who you are. If you accept that you can attain values through lying, yes, you'll be able to attain certain things and maybe you won't get caught. But that very action destroys your soul and it destroys your soul because it destroys your capacity to be rational because it introduces falsehood into a machine, a, 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 a thing that requires facts. But you assume that it destroys the soul. Oh no, I mean, the empirical evidence is unequivocal. And, and, and not only is, it, is the empirical evidence unequivocal, you can introspect and see it. You can introspect and see it. You know, and, and I often tell young people, you, you want to see that lying destroys the soul? Spend a couple of days just lying. Take your best friend and lie to them periodically. I know plenty of people who lie very easily. I, I know lots of people who lie very easily and they're all miserable. And if they're not miserable yet, they will be soon. Okay. <laughs> yeah. Don't look at adults because you can train yourself not to feel guilty and even to get a certain power trip out of line. Look at kids when they do it. And there's a real, I mean, you can see the destruction of the soul in those moments. And as, some, as a father of children. So, I mean, look, at the end of the day, fine. If you think lying is the path to happiness, go for it. Go out and try it. Uh, I'm not going to. Yeah, no, I mean, this is, this is, it is, it, well, you know, morality is, it's, it, again, it's not this dogma. 
that is imposed on you by an external force and everybody's watching you, will she get away with it or not? Yeah, you can, you can do all kinds of lies, particularly you can lie to yourself very effectively without getting caught. Um, although you know you're lying to yourself. But try it. But you know, it's, and it doesn't work. It's interesting, for example, the ultimate one of the we, like here, what we're talking, it's like a masturbation, you know, we just talk, talk. But then see real life example of morality that people go to war and they see uh, things that, you know, they, their head can't process the pain they, they witnessed. And it's such it's a problem uh, for the post traumatic, uh, post traumatic. Uh, Sure. So, so you know, it's so somebody who's been to war. Yeah, and they just no. As I, I have been to war. So somebody has been to war, and been in a war. Yeah. And, and as somebody who is not masturbating here because I live it now, I won't. <laughs> I won't elaborate on that one. That was complicated. Um, but this is not masturbation because this is life, right? This might seem like we're talking. We're just talking, but this talk means something. Because it's reflective of how we behave and what kind of life we live. This is not some theory that, we, that is over there and we don't live it. And then when, you know, so people go to war. And what they discover is that there's a lot of evil in the world. And there is indeed a lot of evil in the world. And the question is, and part of how people process that is determined by what kind of self-esteem they have and what kind of attitude they have towards their own life. So I can process the evil of war in the context of that's something I want to avoid. That's something I don't want to have to live through. That's why I want to live a different kind of life. And I want to fight against the things that create this evil, the things that make this evil possible. So the, the, the fact that there's real evil in the world just makes it very real and concrete to all of us that we need morality. We need morality to avoid that evil. And indeed, a moral world would not have war. Let me give two examples in terms of uh, in terms of getting away with it. One fictional one from real life. Have you watched the Casa de Papel, the heist? Yes. There's a figure there, the professor. He's a very clever guy who, who you could imagine would be a millionaire in any line of business. He decides to be a thief, a crook. He quotes, sorry for the spoiler, gets away with it. He's not cut. What does this mean, though, for the rest of his life? His success is that now he has to live in an island somewhere in the middle of nowhere, and he has to hide for the rest of his life. He got away with it, and the rest of his life is hiding. A real-life example, Stalin, one of the most evil persons in history. He died of old age, and the last 40 to 50 years of his life, what? Probably. Probably. The last 50 years of his life, he was paranoid. He was so paranoid that one day, his presumably best friend, Lavredi Beria, the head of the secret police, shows up in his house, and because Stalin had screwed up the war, it was the beginning of the Nazi invasion, he was sure that Beria came to arrest him. Now imagine this. You've led a life which has led you to the point that you hear your best friend being outside of your house, and your assumption is, okay, I'm going to end up in the torture chamber and I'm going to be killed. This life sucks. And what was la Stalin's last moments? Lying on the floor and no one daring to go there because all his friends, the Politburo, wanted to make sure that he dies. This life sucks. And he got away with it. He didn't die in the gulag. He wasn't executed. He didn't fall in the coup. But he led the life which sucked. His wife committed suicide because... Probably she hated him so much. Imagine living with this. Because he loved his wife. Imagine having this in your consciousness. So the fact that you get away with it, if you do the wrong things, doesn't mean that your life is... Uh, so do you know the real the, 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 uh, real life story of the heist? No. So, so um, there's a famous robbery in, 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 in Britain, the, the Great Train Robbery, uh, where they got away with a huge amount of money. And some of them got away. Um, and, and a, a famous example, one, one of the top guys who was part of the robbery, it was a, it was a very sophisticated robbery. He made it to South, South America with a lot of money. And he lived in South America, you know, uh, uh, I can't remember if it was Argentina or Brazil, he lived there, or Uruguay, Uruguay, I don't know. Um, lived there with a lot of money and, and, you know, had all the luxuries of money. 
And about 20, I think it was 20 years after the heist, he came back to the UK and gave himself in. And he said, I can't live with myself. I, I hate my life. I hate everything about my life. And I have to, I have, you know, and everybody knew he was the train robbery. Just, so there was a warrant out for his arrest and everything, but there was no, um, uh, uh, what do you call it? Treaty. Extradition. There was no judicial treaty. So he literally came back to the UK and gave himself up because he couldn't, he couldn't live with it. And actually, it, actually, I can tell you the, the real story. Oh, yeah. yeah. It was Ronnie Biggs. Yeah. He lived in Rio de Janeiro, Brazil. Yeah. Married a local girl, had kids. That's why he could not be extradited back to England. Because he was married to a Brazilian. Correct. With children. But he got cancer. Yeah. And he could not get good treatment in Brazil. So that's why he came back to the UK, because he felt he could get better treatment for his cancer in the UK. He knew that he would be sent to prison in the UK, but he preferred to have uh, been the hospital wing of a UK prison rather than in Brazil. So, you know, he, he had money. He could have gone to a lot of other places in the world that don't have extradition treaties with the UK to get his cancer treatment. Well, I, you know, I, I, at least what I read, I, I, I don't, I remember him. There was a whole article about the guilt he felt and how horrible he felt and the fact that he wanted to, in a sense, you know. Yeah, I'm not saying you're wrong, because, by the way. Yeah. I'm not saying you're wrong yeah. in your theory yeah. of what it's. No, I mean that was that was what I read. I, it wasn't. It's not my theorizing around it. That that was the story that was told as I read it, and yeah. I, I can't remember the exact. Okay, history. so yeah. we have a super chat on Kanye because it's out of topic. It's going to be last. So Kanye. <laughs> yeah, Kanye. How do I pronounce it? <laughs> but before we're going to end with Kanye because it's off topic. But before Kanye, you're next, right? Yeah. <laughs> Kanye is never off topic. <laughs> so, I read the um, Psychology of Pleasure, Nathaniel Brandon in Virtual Selfishness, where he states that pleasure as a reward is the ultimate statement of reality that I am in control, and pain being the statement of I am helpless. So, could it be that the appeal of stoicism, of where people are feeling so much pain or with so much um, stimulus that it does feel painful the stoicism kind of allows them to feel a sense of control through that pain because from my memory like the the most um you've reached the ideals of stoicism when you can be tortured and be okay with it and sorry um yeah i mean that's a good i mean it's a good analysis in a certain front but what you're describing is heroin it's I'm suffering and now I'm numbing. And the whole thing is like a numbing, a numbed life is not a life. And so, I, look, I'd rather somebody not suffer than suffer, but you can actually be happy and joyful. And that's the kind of perspective that we're reaching out, which is like the ideal life is not I'm in a heroin induced bliss uh, for you know 30 years or whatever. And I completely agree with you as well. I just wanted to add in terms of helping other people, choose objectivism as the preferred one because we are biologically programmed to avoid pain more than go towards pleasure. How can we create or how can we take these abstract principles and create a very good framework where it gives them those first few steps on the ladder of like, right, first do this, then this. Does that make sense? Oh yeah, I have an answer to that. You go first. Yeah, um, yeah I want to say something about pain and pleasure. Because I, I don't quite interpret it the way you did. So Nathaniel, I think, is making a metaphysical point. That this is kind of how, this is the most basic, most fundamental, most metaphysical thing that babies feel, right? They avoid pain, they're poor pleasure. Pain is, you reject, you kind of reality is against you, you're out of control, pleasure is it's supportive of you. Because if you think about John Gold's being tortured, right? He's not a stoic, but he but he also doesn't let the pain go, you know, he doesn't let the pain, in a sense, get to him, right? It doesn't change who he is. He doesn't let it, uh, he's not out of control. Because he has a cognition. 
He can control that. He can. He knows what's going on, right? So even though that gives him that metaphysical sense of out of control, because he's who he is, because he has a set of ideas, because he has a philosophy, it, the the torture is not him feeling out of control. Um, what happens with most people who don't have a philosophy is is exactly you know what you describe. For them, that that pain stays. I'm out of control. Instead of okay, this is a context. There's certain context here. I feel the pain in this context. I can handle it because I know you know what the antidote to it is. Um, so it's it's. I think it's important to to not take that. You know, not say that that pain is a sense of out of control. That's not how it's always perceived, because once you become conceptual, you have the ability to control that. That's what the Stoics are taking advantage of, in a sense. But what Gold does, because he has a philosophy, because he has a life. So this idea of controlling and living with pain is not unique to the Stoics. Right? They want you to reject the positive. That's what's really controlling pain, or, or being able to live with pain, or being able to manage pain, is something that I think any rational person could do because they know pain is not the essential of what life is. Well, I mean, also part of it is the best way to cope with pain is insofar as you can see it in service of a pleasure. So, I mean, think about like a workout is deeply painful and uncomfortable, and the way that it becomes, it doesn't make you feel out of control or like life is awful because you can see it almost as. This is like my tribute to the positive I'm trying to achieve, which is, you know, health, a good body, energy, and so on. And it's the more that you can see pain as serving a positive, that's actually a better way to cope with it than just trying to disengage from life and nothing bothers me at all. It's more that you're tying it to a positive value that you're pursuing. Um, the thing I was going to say to get to the end part of your question, which is what one thing that I definitely think will help objectivism be more of a cultural influence is it's presented and it is a philosophy so it's abstract fundamental guidance on how to live but part of what you want is you want a philosophy translated into much more actionable tactical kind of guidance and so for instance my book effective egoism part of what's trying to do is take objectives and, and give more specific guidance on how do you implement this what would it look like to take the first steps on the journey to being more productive more rational um, uh, to grow my self-esteem. And I think there's a lot more work to make it all the way down to like super tactical, like, okay, here's an exercise you can use that's gonna help you form the clearer values, that's gonna help you overcome the obstacles. And indeed, part of what I'm doing at the Ayn Rand Institute is I run the coaching and mentoring program. And part of what we're trying to do is get to that very, very tactical level so that hopefully in a few years, you know, we can have like, the, you know, the workbook to, you know, objectivism in 90 days. It's not really going to be that. But you get my point where it's going to be, you'll have the fundamental guidance on understanding the ideas and, and how, like, what's their justification. But then, like, okay, now I know what I can really do to build my self-confidence, to become a better thinker, to f discover a career that I love, to, um, you know, you know, wind my way through romance and so on in, in really healthy, rational ways. I think we're going to get there to the point where um, you'll basically just have a toolkit to really make the most of this philosophy, but we're kind of in the earliest stages there. It's taken, it's taken a lot of us just decades to learn what the hell the philosophy is, let alone um, be able to kind of serve it up in a very digestible form. But I agree 100%. Once that exists, I think that helps objectivism as a cultural force and it's one reason that's it's one reason I'm excited about the work I'm doing. Um, the main reason is I just love working with our students and helping them achieve their goals. But I can see where this leads in ten years, and I think uh, we'll have some amazing, amazing tools for people who become inspired by Ayn Rand. I see it's like a cool version of like Robert Greene's mastery and uh, Mike Rowe's work. Uh, he's got that big apprenticeship kind of program. I think something like that. Yeah, but, and I mean, ju I, I, I'll just say, one of my inspirations for the kind of book I wanted Effective Egoism to be was Robert Greene, uh, who I disagree with him about Mentor a lot of things. Holiday. What's that? Mentor of Ryan Holiday. Uh, yeah, that's true. Um, but that kind of book where it just feels like it's rich with a lot of really actionable stuff, but it had has a deep perspective on life uh, as well. So, um, 
Yeah, no, I think there's a lot we can do. And I mean, you mentioned Mike Rowe. That's another thing that I'm not personally doing, but other objectives are, and I hope to see more, which is, um, in effect, creating companies and apps and things that kind of, like, I'll give you one example of somebody who's already doing something like this. Lisa Van Dam is an objectivist, started a school, it's an amazing school, um, and uh, she educated Leonard Peikoff's daughter and so on. Now she's created, her passion is getting people to fall in love with literature. Well, one thing you could have done was you could be Lisa's friend and she invites you over for a book club, which I was, you know, lucky enough to go through. But how do you scale that to millions of people? Well, she created an app where she leads you through the books that she really loves. And so this is something that kind of scales learning how to love literature, which is uh, promotes objectivism in a really fundamental way. But it teaches you how to be a valuer in a fundamental way. And I think the more that we can, in effect, like productize different aspects of getting value out of philosophy, that it really creates an enormous cultural impact over time. Yeah, and uh, let me just say something positive before we get to Ken Kenya, because I'm not sure. <laughs> um, <laughs> but Don is going to take that question. I'm not going to. Well, I don't know what the question is yet. Yeah. I, I make no promises. But um, I mean, this this is really uh, relates to the original question of of why hasn't objectivism been more successful, and uh, and how do we become more successful? And and it's it, to some extent it's a numbers game. Um, you know, at some point, objectivism will grow exponentially, and a part of that is going to be the curve we have right now, which looks very, very shallow, but all exponential graphs go very, very, very slow, and then you see that. And the question is, what causes that? And I think what causes it is the kind of work that Don described. I think what causes it is just the sheer number of intellectuals actually talking and teaching and speaking and, and, and in a sense, at whatever level they do it, taking these very, very abstract, difficult ideas and chewing them for people and making them more palatable and easier to digest for people. What we need is, is you know, uh, anywhere between 100 and 1,000 intellectuals who are active, who are in the culture, who are constantly talking about this, uh, writing, speaking, uh, you know, engaging with people. That is what will lead to, to you know, this real change because this is not superficial. It's not like one guy can come, oh, I've got another twist on altruism. Let me do this. And then, oh, that's kind of cool. And for 50 years, I'll follow that. And then somebody else will come with another twist. We're asking people to change everything. And to change everything requires, you know, kind of what the Enlightenment did or what uh, Kant did on the negative or what any significant intellectual movement that challenges the very foundations of everything. And the Enlightenment may be the best example. It takes decades. And right, we're with the Enlightenment on steroids, because we're not afraid to challenge even deeper beliefs than the Enlightenment. The Enlightenment wouldn't challenge really religion, not not at, at, at the metaphysical and epistemological level. They wouldn't challenge a lot of issues at the very deep level. They wouldn't challenge morality. We're challenging all of that plus everything that the Enlightenment stood for. So it's it takes time, but but it takes people. It takes intellectuals. It takes the people doing that kind of intellectual work to get the ideas out there that will ultimately change uh, change the world. So, um, you know, that's we need a lot of Don, so we need Don to be training a lot of people. And again, that exponential growth will happen if we continue on the path we're on today. So the positive message of the night is the compound effect works to our advantage. So many thanks to Christopher, to Nick, and Apollo Zeus for their super chats, and we'll go to the next question. Your last. So, Gani is the last person. So, my question was how does one argue for someone for whom happiness and how does flourishing. One what? Sorry. How does one argue for someone for whom happiness and flourishing are not the standard, like an environmentalist mm -hmm. or a Christian? And can one, can one argue with them at all? Well, we, you can't argue with any environmentalist or any Christian. Some of them are hopeless. And, and, you, and it's good to figure out who's hopeless quickly so you don't waste too much of your time. Um, but some of them are not. Then what you're arguing is about the standard. That is, you have to argue about why do you care about the environment? Why is Mother Earth? You know, so you have to challenge them at, at where they live. You have to challenge the very foundations of what and show the contradiction in, in what they are holding and what they believe and, and what they're living towards. The same with religion. 
you have to show them that that is you have to challenge why that is the standard for which they believe as long as they accept that standard they can't accept yours so you have to you have to challenge it at its root yeah i mean i, I agree 100 percent with what Yaron said the way i think about it is whenever you have a disagreement at the level of the framework sometimes just making explicit what your framework is, is enough for people to go, oh yeah, that makes more sense. I had kind of a vague, hazy idea. But often it's not. And there you have, there's two things that you need to do. One is you expose contradictions in their framework and provide a clarifying alternative. And two is you expose injustices or destruction from that follows from their framework and offer an inspiring alternative. And if, if you think about why Atlas Shrugged is so effective, it's exactly what she does in Atlas Shrugged. She exposes the incoherence and contradictions and altruism and unreason and then offers a clarifying alternative. And she, you see the destruction and injustice that follows from the kind of conventional philosophy and you get this inspiring alternative. But that's basically how you attack a framework. But as Yaron pointed out, that only works with somebody who has some amount of desire to live, some amount of valuing their life, some positive values to appeal to. And there are people who really don't, and you can't convince them, but that's fine. You don't need to convince them. They're, they're, they're irrelevant uh, in a context where the culture is not controlled and defined by them. And also, not, don't be weird and creepy. So, <laughs> no one's going to be persuaded by someone who is weird and creepy. So, the other day I wrote something about... This is why we're failing. <laughs> <laughs> so, the other day I wrote something solidarity related to Ukraine on Twitter. And someone replied, wait a minute, aren't you an objectivist that doesn't selfishness mean we don't send help to Ukraine? Something like that. Now, from the profile pic, the guy was probably 16 or 17, and he got like 15 followers. And then there were three people saying, no, what are you saying? Objectivists are not saying this. And I'm like, wow, wow, guys. <laughs> Calm down. This guy, perhaps the first time in his life, is interacting with objectivists. And the idea he gets is that three people are telling him, you don't understand objectivists. That's not the way. So... It's, it, and you mentioned Lisa about that. What she does very well is she doesn't preach objectivism like that. So she has this app called The Read With Me, and she's analyzing Les Miserables. And for those of you who've read the Les Miserables, there are some very religious figures there. And when she's analyzing them, she's, she, she's pointing out, notice how they stick to their principles. Notice how they're people of values. She doesn't say, Oh, this person is for sacrifice, and we condemn that because then people are like, okay, that's weird. I'm leaving it aside. So let's try not to be weird. What's the positive version of that? Let's try to be thoughtful. Well, yeah, I mean, I'll put it this way. Uh, I've become increasingly convinced. Uh, so I teach a lot. I, I'm teaching a course at our uh, at the Iron Institute, uh, our school, Iron University, on persuasion in a few months. Um, and I've become increasingly convinced that a big part of persuasion is not like the communication tactics you use, it's who you are and how you are. And you can put this as authenticity, but part of how people are persuaded is they perceive you as a real person that they would, like, whenever you're trying to convince somebody of something philosophical, particularly morality, you're saying, in effect, think like me, live like me. And if you come across as either kind of like, this guy who's just mouthing an ideology and you have no personality or it seems phony or you come across as weird, the, what people take away is, I'm not listening to your argument. If this is what your ideas achieve, I want nothing to do with it. Whereas if you come across as a person who's like, yeah, that guy seems like, or that woman seems like they're living a life that I would want to live or they have a quality that I would want to have, then now it's, okay, well, let me hear your argument and I'm interested in it and I'm kind of, um, likely to, to, to process it in a more um, intrigued way rather than a more I'm trying to reject it way. And so I, a big part of how I think about persuasion now is be somebody who's who, who I want to emulate and then give me your argument. Like that's, I think, the right recipe. Good. Have we got any final questions or is it kind of time? It's kind of time. Uh, we got one more. We got what one is more. the one? Okay, yeah. Uh, so my question is, you, you talked about good life, what is a good life? Uh, do you define it subjectively or objectively, as in 
can can somebody just out of nowhere say, hey, this is what I think a good life is, and uh, this is how I'm going to live it, and I don't care about anyone else. Can people do that? Well, I think part of what we try to get across is that we definitely think there's an objective conception of what a good life is, and to kind of summarize points that we've made, but Yaron was really elaborating on, um, the briefest summary I can give is that it's a life of reason, where you're using your, your mind as your tool of survival to select your ideas, to select your goals, to pursue your values, reason all the time in every issue. It's a life of purpose, where you're aiming at pro-life goals. You're trying to ch achieve your happiness with every choice that you make, and above all, that you have a productive purpose that is at the center of your life, that the core of how you walk through this world is as a creative being who's generating the values that they need to live. Uh, to put it more simply, find a career you love and build your life around it. And then finally, it's a life of self-esteem, where you set demanding moral standards for yourself based on reality and based on human nature, and you strive to live up to them, and you never let your, you never settle for less than the best from life. That is the core of what is objectively good for a person, and as Jerome pointed out, that leaves a lot of optionality for where do you want to live, what kind of work do you want to do, what kind of jokes do you like, what kind of men or women do you fall in love with. There's a lot of options, but those three cores run throughout all of us in terms of what actually is good and what will allow you to thrive and achieve happiness. And, and they, they run through all your uh, optional values. As the optional values can't contradict any one of them because that, that will create conflict and it will create internal conflict and it will be, it will subvert the survivor value of the three that, that, um, uh, that Don articulated. And then of course, it, the integration of all of them, they should all be integrated around you, around your life and your love of life and, and, and your pursuit of life. So it can't be you just decide, I'm, I'm living a good life. It, it, it can't be something arbitrary like that. It can't be anything that you do. Um, to live a good life is to <coughs> pursue a specific type of life with a specific methodology. The methodology of reason. Okay. Comments on Kanye West's uh, latest uh, statements. What was it? That, uh, okay, the one was that obesity is the, the, glor the glorification of obesity is demonic, and something about the Jews. Are uh, the Jews related to the obesity? No, <laughs> no. but they're behind cancel culture or something like that. I, no, I mean, my, not. like, look, my view is Kanye West. If you like hip hop at all, he's a really brilliant creator, particularly early and middle period Kanye. Um, but he's clearly a person who has severe, severe um, psychological problems. He's admitted it. And I don't take these comments as these are considered comments of somebody who like hates Jews. This is somebody with severe bipolar disorder, and it's really tragic that it's not being handled in a way clearly that is conducive to his well-being, so I find it really sad. And the fact that people are treating it as if, like, a, a, you know, I came up here and was starting to say anti-Semitic things. Um, hopefully, you're wrong to punch me in the nose if I did it. Um, like, I, I don't put it in that category. I just find the whole thing really tragic. Okay, makes sense. So, many thanks again for honoring us with your time. Razi, any parting thoughts? Razi is the creator and the organizer of anything that happens in ARC UK, so he deserves the last word. <laughs>